Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to Open Source Summit North America here in lovely Seattle, Washington. Uh, I found something funny out today. Uh, how many people here are staying at the Sheraton Grand Hotel? Quite a few of you. Apparently, there's a, a bunch of uh, a Microsoft executive event going on also at the Sheraton Grand, and I was talking to one of their folks this morning saying, you know, not that long ago, uh, an open source event also being at the same venue would have been some kind of epic troll. Uh, but now it's just like a happy coincidence uh, here in Seattle that we're here. Microsoft obviously now a huge part of the open source community uh, with things like GitHub and all of the activity they do in that uh, arena. We have a bunch of announcements to make today and a whole bunch of things to cover. So I'm gonna talk relatively fast and uh, wanna start by introducing a new sneak preview, work in progress of a uh, new net event app that we have. Uh, it's an AI powered networking app because everything has to be AI powered these days. Um, but go ahead and look for this. You should have gotten an email with a link to the application. You can also look for Linux Foundation events in the App Store. Uh, and you can use this to make uh, connections, to see the schedule, look at the map of the exhibit halls, and more. Uh, for those of you who are still using the Sketch app, uh, that is also available. There's a QR code on the back of your name tag, and you can use that also to find sessions and so on. Um, tonight, we're going to have uh, an event uh, at the Solution so Showcase, which is right next door. That's going to be open daily at the end of uh, the keynotes. Uh, we are going to serve lunch there uh, as well this year. Uh, there's lounge areas and activities, so feel free to just kind of hang out over there if you like. Uh, we also have an evening event, uh, same venue, starts at 5 p.m. We'll be serving drinks. Uh, it'll be a great way to network with uh, fellow attendees, so uh, hopefully you can take advantage of that. Uh, also, uh, don't miss out on the Women and Non-Binary in Open Source Lunch sponsored by Discover Today. Now, this is open to all attendees who identify as women or non-binary. Uh, no pre-registration required, so if you want to participate in that, uh, just go down to uh, Terra Suite 2 on Level 4 for lunch. Uh, we also have a Ask the Experts uh, set of opportunities at the event uh, this year. Uh, in the afternoon break today, we have uh, these sessions. It's a great opportunity to talk one-on-one -on -one with uh, longtime community leaders. Um, there are, uh, are at 255 in the Olympic View uh, Lounge are today's session. So uh, take advantage of that opportunity. Finally, we're doing something new today. Uh, at the end of our keynotes each day, we are going to raffle off some prizes. Now, I was told it wasn't because I drone on and on and people end up leaving. Uh, I was told that this would be a fun new game that we could play. Uh, so if I am droning on and you are indeed thinking of leaving, think again because we have prizes for all of you at the end of today's keynote sessions. We have a GoPro Hero 12 camera, uh, we've got noise canceling headphones and a Nintendo Switch. So hopefully you will all stick around for that. Uh, finally, I want to remind everyone to please abide by our event code of conduct. We, we really want everyone at these events to fee, feel welcome uh, and included. There's lots of uh, new people here, and it's really important that we bring them into our communities because they are the folks who will indeed be future leaders in uh, our communities. Uh, if you have any concerns at all, the event staff uh, are available at the lobby on level one or any information desk, or you can just look for uh, Linux Foundation event staff. They have uh, name tags on that identify them, uh, and we're here to help. I want to also thank our 2024 sponsors and program committee. Uh, you know, one of the nice things about this event is we bring lots of different communities together, and it's a lot of work to go through all of the content choose who's able to speak, curate the sessions, really make it uh, a meaningful experience for all of us. And so I want to thank all of the volunteers and sponsors who come together uh, to do this. Let's give them a, a quick round of applause. Thank you. I also want to thank uh, our diamond sponsor, uh, Amazon Web Services. We're here in their hometown. So uh, thank you, Amazon, for sponsoring the event. Uh, I want to thank Google as well uh, for sponsoring the event. 
Uh, I want to thank uh, Hedera as well, who's been a top-level event sponsor for today's event, as well as the Technology Innovation Institute. All of these companies have made uh, this event available, so let's give them also a quick round of applause. Last but not least, our platinum level sponsors, Docker, Microsoft, OpenSearch, the Open Source Security Foundation, and Red Hat have really helped to make this event a great experience for all. So give them one final round of applause. Thank you. So hopefully I got through uh, this as quickly as possible on the announcements. And I want to talk a little bit today uh, in the time that I have uh, about some of the opportunities and challenges that we're seeing across the open source ecosystem here at the Linux Foundation. You know, this event is really fun because it's not, you know, specialized just in cloud or just in security or just in, you know, JavaScript projects. All of the open source ecosystem gets together at the Open Source Summit to talk about broader challenges beyond just specific technologies and specific vertical industries, and that's what makes it fun. And I think it's a good time for us to talk at a high level about some of the challenges and opportunities we're facing. Now, before I get into those challenges and opportunities, I want to make one uh, quick announcement. Uh, and that is that we have a uh, new project at the Linux Foundation we're announcing today in the industrial IoT space. Uh, a group of organizations came to the Linux Foundation, uh, ABB, Capgemini, Microsoft, Rockwell Automation, Schneider Electric, and Siemens, and said they are having a problem in complex multi-vendor industrial manufacturing facilities, particularly those that require edge networking technology, uh, to operate and interoperate effectively uh, and wanted to work with the Linux Foundation to develop uh, a, both an open standard and a set of open source code to improve the interoperability in these complex IoT environments. Uh, and so we're really happy to announce that project today. Uh, it's the Margo project. Uh, for more information about the Margo project, just go to margo.org. Uh, it will also be at the Hanover Messe uh, trade show, which is the leading industrial trade show uh, held in Europe uh, later this year. So, Let's, uh, now that I've gotten through my announcements, I, I wanna talk about some of the challenges we're seeing that can also create opportunities for open source. And I think uh, this week, uh, open source security has uh, come up again uh, as a headline-grabbing issue uh, and concern for folks around the world. Um, you know, when, when I get uh, calls or texts from friends who saw an open source uh, article in the New York Times or uh, in a mainstream uh, media outlet, uh, that's when I know that it's something big. Uh, how many people here have he heard of or know about the XZ uh, attack that happened uh, recently? Is that pretty much everyone? All right, who doesn't know about it? Because I'm not gonna go into the details here. All right, we got like a couple of people who don't know about it. Essentially, this was a social engineering attack on an open source project. Uh, an, I, an individual identity, Gian Tan, uh, spent a couple of years working in the open source community up to a point where this person was given uh, commit access, was given a maintainer role in the XZ project. Uh, and uh, fortunately, uh, the, uh, th this individual uh, did this, uh, unfortunately, in order to put some uh, code that would compromise a lot of important systems. Again, I'm not gonna go into the detail of it. Um, but fortunately, this was actually caught. This backdoor, this vulnerability was actually caught uh, by a Microsoft employee who was uh, reviewing the code uh, and allowed us to figure out that uh, this uh, identity, Gian Tan, had actually intentionally, through years of sort of social engineering, got to the point where that identity had commit access uh, in XZ uh, and was able to try and, and, and do this. And so the system sort of worked uh, in discovering the vulnerability, good, but the system wobbled a little bit in that this identity that we now know was subterfuge uh, actually got the commit bit in an important project, in this case, XC. 
And that is something that we should all uh, be concerned about. And what it exemplifies is the difference between security and trust. Which is, security we talk a lot about, trust is something I think we need to talk more about. And I'll get to that in a second. I don't want to say that there has not been an amazing amount of work done over the last several years in particular on improving the collective security of the open source ecosystem. How many people in this room have been working on projects to improve open source security? Whether it's package signing like SIG store, do we have some SIG store folks in the room? Um, whether it's on uh, things that help us to secure supply chains and uh, understand provenance uh, like Salsa, uh, whether it's on uh, the Open Source Security Foundation scorecards, whether it's on uh, contribution of grants to critical software projects to help them improve their security, automated testing, so on and so forth. There is a, a not only amazing amount of work going on across the industry, in the Open Source Security Foundation, uh, also in government. Uh, I think there are folks uh, here today from CISA and other parts of governments from around the world who are really doing pretty incredible work uh, in a really productive and sort of open source understanding way, for lack of a better term, to help us improve our security. And I think that has had meaningful impact in improving uh, the security profile of a lot of critical open source projects and how the open source supply chain works. However, these social engineering attack vectors are somewhat novel. You know, there's been package squatting, which you could kind of say is a social engineering attack, uh, but this type of attack, a multi-year uh, way of getting to the commit bit uh, is pretty novel. And what we found out this week uh, is that XZ is not alone. Uh, in the JavaScript community, uh, we also discovered, uh, that community, I should say, discovered uh, another uh, takeover attempt uh, that was similar uh, to the XZ vulnerability. And again, I won't go into all the details of this because I don't have a ton of time, uh, but I wanna take us up one level as the you know, kind of collective open source community and look at security and look at these type of attacks and start to consider what are some of the things that we could do to make these type of attack vectors harder. And I think it starts with asking three basic questions about open source as it relates to our collective cybersecurity. And forgive me for droning on in this part. For the, I, I've, I've given this talk many times about these three questions, uh, and it's been sort of my uh, white whale or the windmill I tilt at in that uh, I, I've been trying to, and the Linux Foundation has, and the industry has been trying to answer these three questions for years and years and years. They're simple questions, right? What is the world's most critical software, shared software? Who writes it, and is it secure and healthy? All right, seemingly easy questions to ask until you start unpacking each one. When you look at what is the world's most critical software, the first thing you have to understand is who's using what. There are millions of open source projects out there, but the ones that, are, that really matter are ones that are actually being used by industry or by society, that are actually being used because, of course, usage creates criticality. You also have to, have to ask, of those critical software components that are being used, is it a truly critical project? Is it network facing? Can you escalate privilege? Like if you compromise that specific project, project does it create a huge wake uh, that, you know, something similar to Log4j? And we have made progress here. Uh, years ago, we partnered with Harvard University to aggregate anonymized software bill of material data from industry in order to get a sense of, hey, here are the open source components that are most often used in production. And then we created a stack ranking of them in order of importance based on both usage and security criticality. Uh, and uh, those were in our census reports. We're now working on our third a census report to get an idea of what is the world's most critical software. But it is no easy task to get that information, aggregate it, and analyze it, right? 
And what's interesting about it is in millions of open source projects, it turns out that there's only about 15 to 20,000 that are truly critical. So it takes the problem from millions down to thousands. And those might vary by vertical industries, but you get the gist. It's a smaller problem and it's tractable. We can figure it out and we're making progress. The third question is also one where we've made a ton of progress per the previous slide. There are tons of great tools out there that do uh, testing, that track dependencies, that are able to discover software vulnerabilities. Uh, we have work that goes on in Linux Foundation projects and other uh, open, critical open source projects to do uh, audit of source code, to literally pay firms to go look at code and create an audit of how they could improve their security basically by looking at the code itself. And so the first question and the last question, I think we're making good progress on. It's the second question that the XZ attack vector really uh, forces us to ask. And, and that's the who. Who writes all this software? And I think when you think about the who, it's different from a security question. Security is like, is there a vulnerability? Can we find that vulnerability? The who is more of a trust question, right? Do we trust this identity, this whoever it is who's contributing this code, enough to give them a maintainer role or provide them a prominent role in uh, the community? I don't have immediate great answers for building reputation systems and trust systems today. There are thousands of historical examples of this. I have some ideas. But today, what I want to ask all of you is to start thinking about this and talking about it more. How can we better create systems that will help maintainers who are already overworked, who are already overwhelmed, to better trust each other, to better assess whether uh, starting with code an identity has no employer, has never showed up in an event, has no, uh, no one's ever met this person uh, or not. I think we need to start thinking about ways to make that easier for our communities. Let me tell you a real quick story about uh, this kind of trust relationship. In 2014, I think it was, the Open, uh, OpenSSL had the Heartbleed vulnerability. How many people here remember Heartbleed? Right, this was a critical open source vulnerability that opened the lockbox on everybody's web browser for lack of a better way to describe it. And I went and raised about $6 million over a few days to help the OpenSSL project improve its security stance. Part of that was audit and testing work, but another part of it was paying developers in the OpenSSL project to work full time on that project. At the time, there were two Steves, Steve Henson and Steve Marquez, that were kind of maintaining the project, and Steve Henson was really the lead maintainer. And we paid to have that group come together and one of the things that we thought we would do at the inaugural face-to-face -face meeting of the OpenSSL developers was to create I am Steve Henson t-shirts. And the reason was almost no one in that community had ever met Steve Henson or knew who he was. And think about that. Like, in this case, it turned out to be benign and I actually know who Steve Henson is and we wired him money to work on it and he is actually an incredibly trustworthy, very good developer. But what if there were ways to discover whether someone had a reputation or not easier so that when you are bringing folks into this community that continues to grow every day, we can know whether or not that person is a complete ghost and make it harder to achieve the kind of attack vector that we saw in XZ or not. That's what I want you all to think about today. Grab me in the hall, I have a ton of ideas about how we can build ways to establish trust that are totally different than asking for a form of government ID. That is not at all what I'm advocating for. It's not at all what we need. Trust starts at code and an identity. And that identity can have no reputation or some reputation or not. 
And then people can make decisions about whether to trust that, repu that reputation, that identity, or not. And let's think about ways that we can do that that are privacy respecting, that respect the norms of the open source community, but also make it uh, harder for these kind of attacks to happen. Now, while that is uh, an important and, and, and uh, concerning topic for all of us, one of the good things about the open source community is we do track our code, right? We know what code is coming into projects, and we do know that some identity has contributed to that code, and we do know what license those things are uh, under, which leads me to an additional concern around uh, open source threats. And I'll just leave you all a second to read this. It turns out that state actor uh, maintainers are not the only concerning uh, component of open source this day, uh, these days when it comes to uh, intellectual property and trust. Uh, last week, uh, we had a, a, a case where our open tofu project uh, had concerns around the intellectual property licensing uh, of that particular code base. Uh, for the quick backstory on this, HashiCorp uh, has an a project called Terraform, which they relicensed uh, relatively recently under a business uh, source license, uh, BAUSL 1.1. Uh, so no longer an open source uh, license. Uh, people in the Terraform community uh, immediately forked uh, that project under its existing license, an open source license, MPL2, uh, as open tofu in January, uh, and started to work to maintain an open source uh, version of that, uh, and has been starting to get real traction with uh, large end users like Allianz. Um, however, last week, that project had an allegation of copyright infringement, um, which made it really confusing for us when we saw a headline in InfoWorld uh, saying that uh, open tofu had taken BSL, non-open source code, and put it into uh, the uh, open tofu code base. Not only did that happen publicly, but simultaneously the open tofu maintainers got a cease and desist letter from a Silicon Valley law firm uh, telling them to take that code out. The main point I want to make on this is that one of the things we have to do well in open source is take intellectual property very, very seriously. At the Linux Foundation, we have a full-time in-house trademark attorney. We have full-time in-house uh, developers who are experts in copyright, who regularly scan our open source projects. We have tools that allow us to uh, process tens of thousands of contribution agreements in an automated and accurate way every year. We take this stuff seriously. And the Open Tofu project fortunately does too. Because when they heard these acquisition, a, accusations, they immediately went and did a source code origination analysis. They knew where all the code was, they knew how it came in, they knew what license it was under, and it turns out that uh, this analysis refuted every single aspect of HashiCorp's allegation. And this is something that I want us all to think about as you're working on open source projects, to make sure that we have uh, good systems in place so that we can all collectively share what we want to share and keep what we want to keep under the correct license. Uh, this is something that I think is critical to all of us. And, and I wanted to take the time to go through this today to really thank the organizations and maintainers who helped defend this right to fork and the consistency of intellectual property sharing uh, in open source. Open Tofu really reminds us why the definition of open source is so important. Which leads me to the final opportunity uh, in open source, and that is related to, of course, artificial intelligence. Uh, and, um, you know, right now uh, in AI, we are all sort of collectively trying to figure out what openness means, right? And if you look at the AI stack from the lowest level at the GPU sort of hardware level all the way up to data, uh, there are different 
definitions of open source that don't really fit traditional code and copyright regimes. And that's something that I'd like us all to also talk about this week. Today, the, uh, last week I should say, the Linux Foundation AI and data community uh, started working uh, on a model openness framework for large language models. Uh, this is in addition to some great work that's going on at the OSI to define what open means in AI. And the way I'd like you all to think about this as you read through these, and I would encourage you to read these papers and look at the OSI's work, is at each layer of the stack, we see greater or lesser openness. At the GPU layer, we see a lot of consolidation around NVIDIA and the CUDA API. There are efforts in the open world under the unified acceleration uh, framework to create an abstraction API that would be uh, consumed both by CUDA and other silicon uh, acceleration technology. I think that'll kind of solve itself. At the infrastructure layer of AI, I think open source is winning. PyTorch and all of the tools that are created, that are used to create large language models are pretty much open source. That's something where open source has a huge advantage. If you go up one more layer to the large language models, we see both closed and open. So we see things like Llama 2 and Mistral that are open, and then you see ChatGPT4 uh, Turbo, which is closed. In large language models, this is where this definition of openness gets a little tricky because you have access to the weights and you're able to kind of tune those models, but you don't really have access to the data, right? So there, this is where I get to the final layer that I think is going to be a challenge for the open community, and that is at that highest data layer. Uh, at that layer, what we're already seeing is the paywalls go up as big data is being used to train frontier foundation models Companies, I think Stack Overflow did this, uh, the Automatic, the WordPress company did this. They're now starting to demand license fees for their data and getting access to large, high quality data sets that are open is not getting easier. It's probably going to get harder. And this is where we have a real opportunity in the open side of the equation to work on how we can create collective open access to large data. At the Linux Foundation, we have a, a sort of an early project that we're working on called the, found, uh, the Overture Maps Foundation. This is a very large, high quality geospatial mapping data set uh, that is open to everyone. And we're gonna continue to curate similar open data initiatives in order to provide that uh, high quality data that will allow better ways to train frontier foundation models, and most importantly, better transparency into how they actually work and are created. Which leads me to the final opportunity with my two minutes left to go here uh, to talk about where open source can also help in AI. AI safety is something that I think we all agree is a concern. And if you look at AI safety risks, there are already AI safety issues upon us. Things like deep fakes, non-consensual sexual imagery are already upon us using AI tooling. Now we could go all the way to theories of, you know, will AI essentially take over the world and be an existential threat? I am not convinced of those sort of vague theories. I'm more concerned about these immediate uh, risks of safety around bias, deep fakes, not consensual sexual imagery. This is where open source also has a great opportunity. I, I can't even believe I'm saying this, but sometimes the answer to problems created by tech is more tech. Uh, usually that's totally not the case, but in this case, I think there is real opportunity for the open source community to create tools to help with AI safety risk. Uh, at the foundation, we have our C2PA initiative. This is a immutable digital water marking uh, project that uh, helps understand provenance of content and prevent deep fakes. Uh, and we have tools in our LFAI and big data initiative around uh, finding intersectional bias and other things. I think there's a lot more work that the open source community can do here. And we're really actively looking to support and promote uh, AI safety tooling uh, throughout the industry. 
And so I know I went through a whole bunch of opportunities and risks in open source, and I hope that this will get all of you talking this week about these topics. One of the greatest things about this community is that once we start the conversation, the next step is to start doing, creating code, starting up an initiative. And I know that in all of the things that I've talked about this morning, there's some folks in this room who either are already working on these problems or would be super happy to start today. So thank you everyone for listening to me this morning on these opportunities. And with that, I wanna introduce a whole bunch of folks who have an amazing set of announcements uh, to make this morning. I'm gonna start uh, with uh, an announcement from uh, Melissa Evers Hood, uh, who, or Melissa Evers, sorry, who's on our uh, Linux Foundation board. Um, in just a few short years, um, the LFAI project communities have gained a ton of momentum. Um, from, you know, the PyTorch Foundation to the Generative AI Commons in 2023, and that growth continues. Today, Melissa's here to, uh, to announce a new LFAI and Data Foundation, uh, and I am welcome, I would be delighted to welcome her to the stage. Can we please have Melissa come on out. Hey, everybody. Are you guys excited to be here this morning? Uh, all right, I am too. Um, so I am here to announce a new project that we are launching with all of your support, hopefully. Um, my name's Melissa and I work at Intel and I have the privilege of leading a number of different software initiatives on behalf of the corporation. And one of those is working with a fabulous team who works in the open ecosystem uh, initiatives for the corporation. And it is in that context that I am here today. So what are we gonna talk about? Well. We have a lot of enterprise customers across um, Intel's customer base, and one of the things that we hear consistently, time and time again from our partners, is that they see the potential of generative AI, they understand its potential value, and yet it's really hard. It's really hard, there's so many choices of different architecture implementations, integration is not foolproof, we don't have the talent, that, and talent's expensive. In addition, there's this notion that we are really struggling with the amount of innovation, and I don't really want to invest a ton and then have that be something that is obsolete in just a few years, or a year, or six months, or a week. So there, we hear this feedback time and time again from our partners, and what we would like to work with you in doing is creating an open alternative to help folks adopt generative AI, AI technologies. Now, why is that important? Because openness, you're here because you understand the value that openness provides with regard to transparency, the speed of innovation, community involvement, the collective brilliance that you bring to the ways in which we solve problems. And as Jim so eloquently articulated, Though that need for openness, that need for innovation, that need for pushing the boundaries of security, transparency, traceability, is only heightened in the context of generative AI. And yet we're in a situation where a thousand flowers are blooming, there's new vector databases, new models, and how do we consume all of this quickly and easily? It reminds me of the days of cloud infrastructure when it was, when you know things were being born in that sphere, or software-defined networking. We are at that moment in the context of generative AI. We need to figure out how do we have modularity, composability, scalability, and do so in a way that enables people to adopt easily. And that is what we are here today to work on. So the open platform for enterprise AI intends to address those use cases, those challenges. Specifically, we're focusing on the RAG pipeline and how do we create modularity and composability, security for RAG adoptees that integrates with the enterprise applications that all of you are using in your particular um, enterprises, but also enables you choice and freedom um, with regard to heterogeneity. 
So with your support and help, we really hope that we will enable um, an implementation that can span from on-prem to data to cloud. It can be on the edge, your AI PC, in your data center, however you are interested in deploying your RAG frameworks. It is based in open, although if you want to use proprietary models, that is something that this implementation should also support. We need to validate it. It needs to be scalable. And finally, most importantly, in my opinion, it needs to be trusted. The emerging technologies around AI security for generative uh, RAG pipelines is still very nascent. And we need to figure out how we as an industry align on a set of expectations that not only enable security, but trust and traceability. Now, our intention is not to invent all of this. Our intention is to utilize the parts that exist within the ecosystem. The notion with OPIA is that we will harness the collective intelligence of the ecosystem writ large, but do so in a way that is, integrates it, validates it, provides reference solutions for specific RAG use cases that enterprise need um, on a daily basis. And so with that, um, we have a number of partners that have joined us in this effort. Um, and we have a session that will be later today um, at, the, at, at 325. Um, and I hope you'll join Arun and I to talk about um, what we are trying to achieve with OPIA. Additionally, we're going to do a community meetup in Portland, Oregon um, in the middle of May. So while we have a lot of partners that have joined us in this initial launch, we also are very interested in your participation because it's only going to be through the broad community that we can integrate, align, and enable the scalable deployment of generative AI and re realize the potential for innovation that we all see ahead of us. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa, for your leadership on this. Uh, I think this is an amazing project. Uh, our next speaker is going to talk about a project that has been, uh, I think, our mutual uh, white whale for, for many years, uh, and that is software bill of materials uh, specifications, which sounds a little bit wonky, uh, but with software bill of materials metadata, with a common standard that we all use, getting to what is the world's most important software is a lot easier. Because if we have SBOM liquidity, so to speak, if everyone's using this and it's integrated in all the build systems that people use to create software, we can much more quickly identify components when there's a problem and proactively aggregate and uh, understand what is being used. Today, we have a really exciting announcement in the advancement of that software bill of materials uh, uh, liquidity, um, and that is the release of the SPDX 3.0 specification, which uh, includes a lot of improvements that make it easier uh, and provides a level of detail that can handle the needs of modern systems when it comes to software bill of material metadata. SPDX is a ISO recognized standard. And today to tell us about SPDX 3.0 is Bob Martin, the Senior Software and Supply Chain Assur Assurance Principal Engineer at MITRE. Please welcome Bob. Thank you. Let's see, got the right slides. Well, um, SPDX 3.0 has been a six year challenge. Um, and you wonder, well, what took so long? So back in 2010, 12 years before that, there was a lot of social issues about, you know, what's in software and, you know, your car, you can't update your software. You don't even know what software's in it. That's the I am the Calvary. NTIA put out a community initiative that started getting people to talk about these issues. Um, I actually started an effort in the uh, Consortium for Information and Software Quality to build a SBOM standard for tools. Um, we moved that to the OMG. CISA took over the mantle for the leading the uh, fight on bills of materials. 
Then an executive order came out talking about that. And now there's an EU Cyber Resiliency Act. So there's a lot of things going on, trying, driving and evolving the thinking of what uh, software bills and materials are. But one of the things in SPDX 3.0 is it is a bill of materials standard. And oh, by the way, you can do software. You can do licensing. You can do security. You can do build info. You can do AI models. That would be very useful to be able to track the provenance and pedigree of AI models or data sets. So that's what's actually released. It's already covered. Um, I'll show you a tiny bit more about what's behind all that. But think about where this is going. So the, the core of SPDX 3.0 is what do you need to know about managing a bill of material? So we already have thoughts and work going on for a bill of material of hardware, operations, functional safety, um, services, software as a service, and others. So if you have things that need to be tracked and uh, be able to show you know, what's in it, where it came from, and who it came from, please join us on that. So one more thing. What we really did in this work is we changed the S in SPDX from software to system. So just want you to think about that. If you're a tool developer, I want you to come start trying to implement it. We've tried, we've done two candidate releases to get the spec and the details right. Um, and now I'm gonna glaze your eyes over, but I wanted you to show it's real. This is the core profile. Don't try to study it. You can see the slides, it's up on the website. But here's software. So the top is core. That's the part of core you need for software. There's only a couple more data elements for software. Similarly, for licensing, on your uh, left is the simple licensing. That's if you really just want to get the minimum, or if you want to get into the gory details, you can do it. The very top is the core again. So each of these shows you what it's dependent on. So security uses core, and it has information that you can capture the information from a vulnerability, from a VEX um, information, all the things the community cares about tracking and sharing. You can also capture the build information. Um, AI profile, this is the start. If there's other information that needs to be tracked and um, you know, accounted for, there's easy to add on to that. And then the data set profile. So we have data you know, sets in all kinds, so here we can track it. And we also have an extension profile. If you happen to have another format that you want to translate to and from, here's where we can capture that extra data so you can do a round trip. So wanted to offer, this is where you can go get the spec, and I'll be around most of the week. There's others here that have been working on this project. Again, it's been a six-year uh, slog, but I think the result of that is much, much better than it was before we started. So with that, I wanted to thank you, and have a great day. Thanks, Bob. All right, now we have the big slog ahead of us to instrument every build environment on Earth with uh, SBOM-capable uh, tooling, so I'm sure that'll happen in the next couple of weeks. Uh, speaking of long-term efforts, um, I want to introduce someone who's been working on uh, our post-quantum cryptography alliance. Uh, you know, everyone talks about quantum advantage as something that is a uh, concern to all of our collective uh, security. And at the Linux Foundation, we recently announced our post-quantum cryptography alliance. This is a project that brings together industry leaders, uh, academia, developers to address cryptographic security challenges uh, posed by quantum computing. Um, today, I want to introduce from the University of Waterloo, uh, Douglas Stabila, Stabila, who for 10, year, uh, 10 years ago with Dr. Uh, Mikhale Maska started the post-quantum cryptography open source project. Please welcome Douglas. Good 
morning, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here to tell you about the work that we're doing in the Post-Quantum Cryptography Alliance. So let me lay out for you the problem that we're trying to address. So the quantum threat uh, is the concern that uh, a large-scale quantum computer could break much of the cryptography that we're using to secure uh, IT and communication infrastructure today. Uh, now, we don't have a large-scale quantum computer yet, but progress continues on uh, the development of quantum computing technology. And so it's important to start transitioning our security systems now to prepare for the future advent of quantum computers. And one of the reasons for that is what's called the harvest now, decrypt later attack. So the idea is that uh, even though an adversary may not have a quantum computer today, they can be recording the information that's being transmitted today, storing it, and then you know, in however many years, breaking it when a quantum computer becomes available. Not everything will be of interest to them uh, that's being transmitted today, uh, but some of it might be. Some of it might need long-term security. So this is where uh, the transition to post-quantum cryptography comes in. Now, to adopt new cryptographic algorithms requires uh, a multi-stage transition. So first off, we need the development of cryptographic algorithms. And this is work that's being done by academic and industry researchers, as well as uh, standards bodies like the US National Institute of Standards and Technology. Once we have these cryptographic algorithms, we have to integrate them into protocols and applications using bodies like the IETF. And then that brings us to implementation and adoption, where industry and the open source community start to deploy uh, these algorithms. And that's what the Post-Quantum Cryptography Alliance will be focused on. Its goal is to ad uh, advance the adoption of post-quantum cryptography by producing high assurance software implementations of standardized algorithms and supporting the continued development and standardization of new post-quantum algorithms uh, with software for evaluating and prototyping implementations. So we've brought together um, a great uh, alliance of uh, organizations, uh, both in industry, uh, academia, and the not-for-profit se sector to try to achieve these goals. Um, we launched in February, um, uh, building on uh, an existing open project as well as uh, a new launch project. So uh, one of the launch projects we have is the Open Quantum Safe project um, that we've been leading uh, independently for uh, a while now and has recently joined the Linux Foundation. So in this project, uh, we have a library of implementations of post-quantum algorithms, as well as integration into OpenSSL3, one of the most important cryptographic libraries in the open source space. We're also launching a new project called the PQ Code Package, which is gonna be about implementing formally verified and high assurance implementations of standards track post-quantum algorithms. And we're looking to take on new projects as well as the Post-Quantum Cryptography Alliance uh, matures. So uh, you'll be able to hear more about the Post-Quantum Cryptography Alliance uh, this week at the Open Source Summit. So uh, today, just before lunch, uh, there'll be a talk introducing the Post-Quantum Cryptography Alliance by uh, Max from IBM and Hart from the Linux Foundation. And on Thursday, there'll be a kind of a deep dive into some of the technology uh, with folks from IBM, uh, Alex and Max, who'll be talking about uh, the Harvest Now Decrypt Later scenario and some of the technology that we already have available to, uh, to address that threat. So we're very excited to be uh, joining this new uh, open source, or for us at least, uh, this new jo uh, joining of the open source uh, community. And we look forward to uh, hearing more from everyone in the room uh, as how we can be relevant to your work. Thanks very much. All right, so I talked about uh, Open Tofu and uh, an a example of a project where a single vendor open source initiative went from an open source license to uh, a closed license. Um, and today our we have another speaker, uh, which has an example of a different organization that uh, has done the same thing, resulting in a fork. How many people here know or use Redis? Some of you, many of you. Uh, so uh, recently, um, the Linux Foundation, uh, after uh, Redis Labs uh, relicensed their code base, worked with a set of community stakeholders who asked us to host an open source fork of Redis called Valky. 
Uh, we announced it last week with uh, AWS, Google Cloud, Oracle, Ericsson, uh, Snap, uh, and more. Today we're announcing additional organizations who've committed their support. Uh, Avian, Alibaba Cloud, ChainGuard, Huawei, Percona, and Verizon. Uh, to discuss this project today, uh, we have an engineer from uh, AWS, uh, Madeline Olson, who's a principal engineer at Amazon, who has been working on both Redis and now Velky to tell us more about the project. Please welcome Madeline Olson. Thank you, Jim. We are gathered here because we believe in open source. Community-driven projects unlock collaboration and enable innovation across companies and individuals. I'm here today to talk about a new community-driven open source project, Valky. Valky is an open source, high-performance database created from the most recent version of Redis open source 7.2, the last minor version before Redis changed their license away from open source. Valky will continue on as an open source successor to the database users came to love. It will continue to operate as a highly flexible cache, as well as continue to support its beyond caching use cases, such as primary database, message brokering, real-time analytics, and session storage. In order to secure the future of Valky, the Linux Foundation offered the Valky community a place to continue building the project. We are thankful to Jim Zemlin, Mike Dolan, Hillary Carter, and Noah Lehman, and many others at the Linux Foundation for creating a sanctuary where the project continued to grow. From the community and myself, thank you. At the Linux Foundation, Valky will remain community-driven and be welcoming of all users and contributors. Moving to the Foundation will help us get the support we need in order to continue the use and distribution of Valky under the original open source BSD three clause license. Valky was formed by members of the community in the hours and days after the license change. We got together to keep the open source project going because we all care deeply about open source and believe Valky will reach its truest potential through open collaborative development. To form Valky's Technical Steering Committee, we asked community members who have a long track record in making significant contributions to the project. These are the six members of the TSC. Zhao Zhao, myself, Ping Ji, Wen He, Zhu Bin Bin, and Victor Soderquist. The technical knowledge and experience that this group has working on, on Valky is significant. If you add it all up, we represent 26 years and over 1,000 commits onto the open source project before the license change. We are confident that this experience will help us lead the project into the future. And more importantly, the members of the TSC all work for different companies. This kind of diversity ensures that no single company will be able to dominate the project and decide its direction. Valky is governed by the community. The project also has broad industry support from the many companies whose employees, customers, and users depend on open source. As was mentioned, AWS, Google Cloud, Oracle, Ericsson, and Snap were original supporters of Valky. And today, the Linux Foundation announced an additional seven companies to the list of supporters, including Alibaba, Verizon, Percona, Ivan, ChainGuard, Huawei, and Heroku. These companies are planning to continue or even increase their contributions to Valky and have pledged their support for the long-term health and viability of the project. The community is thankful for their support, which will help keep the project open and keep our development moving at the pace that our users demand. 
Our community already had a rich technical roadmap before the project changed the license. The new name doesn't change that. We have already resumed technical development on new features as well as bug fixes as we work to get the project off the ground. We are working now to finalize our governance, solidify development guidelines, and polish our website so that we can resume development for building for the community. Today, I'm excited to announce we have our first release of Valky 7.2.5, which we marked as ready for production this morning. We tried to keep the initial release as compatible with open source Redis 7.2 as possible, just adding a few compatibility APIs so developers can move away from the existing Redis terminology. The release is available today to be built from source, as well as available from our official Docker Hub image and available in Fedora and Epal. We would love for you to download and try it out. And as always, we would love to hear your feedback. We are also hard at work at our next version, major version, Valky 8, which will be available sometime later this year. Some of the features we have already committed to adding to the next release include a new dictionary structure that improves memory efficiency by 15%, great for caching workloads, as well as a slight performance improvement. We're also working to harden the slot migration functionality within Valky to make it more resilient to failures. This is just a small snippet of the features that we have ongoing, and we're working to establish a developer summit to finalize our future roadmap. Valky is a vibrant, fast-moving project, but there's still so much to do. The Valky community is excited to be able to keep working together and innovating on this project that we have spent so much time building. We welcome new contributors and hope you will consider joining us. It is a great time to join the project as we continue to grow and build new features that benefit all users. If you are interested, you can come learn more at our technical session we have later today in room 447 at 2.15 PM. We also have various members of the TSC and significant long-term contributors available at the Expo Hall at the Valky booth. We're happy to answer your questions and would love to hear what you would like to see from the project. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I was backstage and I missed the first part of that, but I heard laughter going on out here. Uh, I'm going to have to go back and review the tape. Um, so, you know, we talk about open and closed, and uh, one of the areas that a year ago the Linux Foundation took on was the idea of an open wallet. How many people here are using a digital wallet today? How many of you? A lot of you, most of you. Um, and you're probably using it for payments, maybe a boarding pass, maybe a car key. But it's clear that digital wallets are gonna be an important part of all of our lives, and they're about more than just paying for something. It's about your digital identity. It's about digital credentials. It involves work from governments. It involves work from financial services. It involves work from credentialing institution. It's all about identity and trust. And uh, today I have Brian Bellendorf here, who is the CTO of the Open Wallet Foundation, to give us an update one year in on how the Open Wallet Foundation is moving the needle on a truly open digital infrastructure for our wallets. Please welcome Brian Bellendorf. Thanks, Jim. Uh, uh, yeah, so wallets are an incredibly important space, right? It really represents the complement uh, for consumers to uh, the web browser, to the email client, as really a third place where you manage something very close to you, something very personal. Uh, your assets, uh, the certifications, people, things have, people have attested to about you, uh, and, uh, and, and this new emerging field of digital assets, you know, NFTs, that sort of thing. Um, so uh, today, but most of you probably have not only you know, Google Wallet or, or Apple Pay, you probably have uh, uh, apps like a zoo app that has your membership to a zoo uh, on it, right? Uh, you probably have uh, an app for each of the airlines that you fly that has tickets for that airline that you have to present when you badge in. Uh, there's kind of a mess on, on the client side when it comes to this. And so uh, what, uh, what a bunch of people have been working on really for the last 20 years is how do we get to greater portability between these kind of attestations 
attestations, these kinds of payment mechanisms, and these kinds of ways of making, uh, there's actually a financial inclusion side to this as well. How do you make it easier for people to uh, attest to, to their, their, their credit history, attest to their educational history, so we don't have to all just trust what somebody says on their LinkedIn page or the like. And so there's been an emerging set of standards in this space, the W3C verifiable credentials, uh, mobile driver's licenses uh, defined by, the, uh, by ISO, others, um, and, and most importantly, a, a standard called SDJOT uh, that has started to really emerge as a privacy-preserving standard in this domain. So the Open Wallet Foundation formed a year ago was a response to this, not, not only this rising interest in uh, the consumer side, this rising tide of technologies that have to start to address this domain, uh, part of which we can owe a debt of gratitude to the Hyperledger Foundation for having homed uh, the Ares client, uh, 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 client side of uh, digital identity solutions uh, for, for a long time. Um, but, uh, uh, but really now government interest in this as well. In fact, the European Union just launched, uh, uh, just approved a law uh, uh, that will require the European Union member states to publish a wallet uh, for each of their citizens, for their citizens um, uh, to hold things like their driver's licenses, their uh, uh, national IDs uh, and, and more. Uh, and so what we're trying to do at the Open Wallet Foundation is we've pulled together a set of projects that have been basically protocol handlers, uh, parsers, ways to try to talk these different uh, underlying kind of standards, but weave them together uh, into, with a point of weaving them together into a, a unified app that can be uh, 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 the basis for one or more mobile apps you will have on your phone, on your desktop, or your other devices. Uh, there might even be wallets for cars, there might even be wallets for other kinds of things to hold records particular to those kinds of things. So we have 10 libraries now that speak these different protocols across uh, lots of different uh, languages, Kotlin, JavaScript, Python, Swift, Rust. Uh, uh, we've got two full wallets uh, under uh, uh, right now, something uh, called Bifold, which again came from Aries, something called the Farmworker OS, which is a really interesting uh, project, uh, again designed for financial inclusion. Um, I, uh, and these are uh, uh, projects that are really the pieces that we're pulling together into something we're calling the open wallet stack. Uh, uh, we have also a bunch of uh, uh, very active interest groups around not just architecture and, 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 and safety, what does it mean for these wallets to be private, privacy preserving, for example, but also trying to map the entirety of the, the landscape around wallets and credentials to better understand what's going on out there in the world and how do we play a useful role in bringing these together. Now, bringing these together is, is so much more important in this space than, than in a typical open source uh, uh, domain, not just because of the government interest uh, uh, out there and the, the mandates that are starting to emerge, but because so many companies now have a real interest in, in being able to reach their, their customers, being able to, to uh, plug into these systems in a way that's highly efficient. And so we're really fortunate that uh, in the Open Wallet Foundation, we've got the participation, not just uh, a bunch of wonderful supporting organizations, organizations like Gen Digital and Accenture and Visa, Futureway and Google, uh, as, as well as a lot of the companies building wallets in this domain, but we've also got many uh, countries as well participating with, with us, including the European Commission and a set of organizations building these wallets for the European uh, Union members, uh, as well as a whole bunch of nonprofit organizations. Um, and the whole idea here is reinforce portability, reinforce uh, 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 kind of the, um, the, the centrality of this around individuals rather than simply uh, being a, a front end to a profile managed a, about you on a, a, re a remote website somewhere, right? This is about empowerment and freedom. Uh, and so if those uh, things matter to you, come join the project. Uh, I'm giving a talk uh, today, kind of a longer form version of this, uh, uh, to really dive into how to participate in what we're doing uh, in the Open Wallet Project, um, uh, Open Wallet Foundation, later today at 4.20. So hope to see many of you there. Thank you. All right. Voila. Thanks, Thanks Brian. Uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, our final speaker in this portion, before we get into a few more keynotes uh, from folks that I think you're all going to be very excited to hear about, and don't forget about the raffle, uh, is Hillary Carter. Uh, she's the head of research at the Linux Foundation, uh, and she's here to tell you about some new things we're doing, providing uh, research to open source communities. Uh, please welcome Hillary Carter. Good morning, Open Source Summit North America. I have the honor of describing some new initiatives at the Linux Foundation, how we are stewarding open source communities in three important ways. Enhanced discovery, new data, and increasing opportunities for community engagement. So let me dig in. 
What do I mean by discovery? Well, at the LF, we host more than 1,000 open source projects. Many of these have websites, um, th their own websites. And we also have numerous collaborative support programs. And so it can be challenging for people in our ecosystem to get the information that they need uh, through the Linux Foundation website. So what we've enabled is for communities to find the resources that they need, particularly with respect to projects that share common goals, and find them through the lf.org homepage through new content portals. Here's some examples. As of this morning, we launched Linux Foundation Security. This is the place where communities of security best practices converge. Here, you'll find the projects, the training, the events, the research, uh, excuse me, the research and other resources that are specific to advancing securing open source software. You'll also be pointed to um, how to report a security vulnerability as well as new guidance on how to avoid recent uh, and continuous social engineering takeovers. So check out Linux Foundation security. Similarly, uh, in December at Open Source Summit Japan, we launched Linux Foundation Management and Best Practices, where you'll find related projects and an example how to use generative AI for software development, what are the best practices? What are the projects that support uh, open source best, practice, best practices and management? A year ago in Vancouver, we launched LF Sustainability. This is the place to go to to find out information about how open source projects across the Linux Foundation are connected to accelerating the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Here you'll find our IBM Call for Code projects. Uh, events, research, and other resources. We also uh, have a, a place to list community events. One such example is the OSPOS for Good Symposium, which is hosted by and taking place at the United Nations headquarters in New York City, uh, and hosting an important discussion on how the Open Source Program Office is a network to accelerate global digital collaboration. So if you have the opportunity, please attend this event and come to know how the OSPO is a vital structure to accelerate global open source as a digital public good. Now, moving on to data. At the LF, we have a priority to be a data-driven organization, and that was the inspiration behind the formation of Linux Foundation Europe, th uh, Linux Foundation Research three years ago. So what we're enabling is access to empirical data within industries and across technology domains and other reference frameworks. Why? Because data drives strategy and decision making. So if you haven't yet discovered Linux Foundation research, please drop in and discover the numerous research projects. We've got more than 50 unique examples uh, demonstrating how open source is, it, is uh, making an impact within industries. And we're answering really important questions. Um, what's the most critical open source software? What do maintainers and uh, developers need? And how can we increase upstream open source contributions? These are the kind of questions that we're answering through LF Research. I'm very excited that today we are publishing our latest report, uh, the 2024 State of Tech Talent Report, which we've done in collaboration with Linux Foundation Training and Certification. This was a survey-based report uh, giving insight into the current state of tech talent. Um, what's the state for acquisition, for retention, and for management on a global scale? We heard from Melissa Evers this morning about how challenging it is to hire talent, and that's no surprise. Here's the key finding from the report. The headline validates this. Upskilling and cross-skilling are at the top of the talent agenda, and for very good reason. Organizations need to work with the resources that they have in-house and give them the training and skills that they need to stay competitive in the marketplace. So give our Tech Talent Report um, a download. Finally, I want to talk about engagement. Um, research is not created in a vacuum, and unicorns and fairies don't create it. People do. 
And, and that's why the perspective of open source contributors is so important. Um, it's invaluable uh, for us to create the kind of data that we need as a community. And so what we want to do is encourage more engagement in our research studies and then give back uh, for all survey completes, uh, we'll be able to make a contribution to the Linux Foundation Travel Fund so that we can encourage other forms of engagement like events uh, here in Seattle that take place on a global scale. So support our research and we'll support the Travel Fund ongoingly and increasingly. Two new surveys launched today, and these are great opportunities for you to get involved. Our World of Open Source Global Spotlight Survey and our 2024 State of Open Standards Study. The Global Spotlight Survey is a worldwide study uh, from which we, we will uh, use a cut of the data to create regional reports, one in Europe, one in Japan. And our 2024 standards study takes a look at how organizations are both using open standards and contributing to them and why. So if you know a thing or two about these topics, I encourage you to take the survey. And finally, um, mentioning that our secure software development education study is still in the field. This is our research that we're doing in partnership with the Open Source Security Foundation. Security is super important, and insights from this research will help us advance security education initiatives where they are needed most. So with that, thank you for your engagement. Thank you for all the contributions that help our communities um, be more robust. <laughs>